Hello, followers. Tonight's story is a direct continuation of the story, Tales of a Ghost Containment Specialist. If you are not yet caught up on the lore, feel free to listen to part one. Link in the description. Enjoy, and let's delve into the dark together. You've been with this company how long now? My boss asked, knowing the answer already. Ten years, I said softly. Can I get something to eat? I've been in decontamination for hours and I miss dinner. In a bit, my boss said. We have some more questions to ask. I sighed. Can I at least get a smoke? Without a word, he pulled out his soft pack and tapped one out. He flicked it across the table to me. I plucked it from Formica and popped it in my mouth. My boss, ever the gentleman, lit it for me. I took a drag and let the smoke and nicotine work its calming magic on me. The room I found myself in, debrief one, was hardly cozy. Four gray walls, two uncomfortable chairs, and one cheap table were the only things in here. That I could see, anyway. I assumed cameras and microphones were everywhere, recording every word and body movement for analysis later. Truthfully, there were probably analysts watching this live right now. At Ghost Containment Specialists, there's no such thing as privacy. At any point in the past, have you had issues with the company? I took another long drag and blew out the smoke. Of course, but I've never said so officially. Why not? I laughed. I wonder, I said, motioning to everything in the room. Why did you feel the need to be critical about the company's decision with the last job? I've already answered this, I said. I told you as it was happening. We need you to say it here. For the cameras? I asked. My boss stayed mum. I sighed. There were multiple reasons for concern. Namely, our team was short by two members, and we had no idea who our client was or why they wanted to unleash some monster spectral energy. My boss corrected. Spectral energy? I repeated, before continuing. In a suburban neighborhood. Not to mention that we were blindfolded on the way to the extraction and insertion process. This was all before we dealt with the ghost tunnel, the sudden daybreak in the middle of the night, and the energy leaks from our gear. None of that is supposed to happen. You mentioned to your co-workers that you had heard voices and whistling. We all heard whistling. I countered. But only you heard voices. Why do you think that is? It was energy leaking from our packs, I said. You're aware that hearing voices is an early indicator of the frets, he said. A GCS agent developing the frets, a mental breakdown brought on by prolonged exposure to spectral energy and leading to eventual death, was a career killer. You would be taken out of the field work with minor exposure and assigned to a desk. If the case was bad enough and they couldn't trust you at a desk, you could be removed from the company. In extreme cases, you weren't allowed to leave the company's compound. This led to rumors, the most violent being that GCS put down agents with the frets. The company never commented on the rumors, which only fueled them. I don't think that that was an accident. I'd do the same thing too if I were them. Fear is a powerful motivator. The company's run tests and everything's come back normal. I don't have the frets. Then why did only you hear the voices? I don't know, I said with a shrug. But if I hadn't heard the voices, there'd be five dead bodies in that smoking crater we left in the neighborhood, yours included. My boss smiled. I don't think it was a happy smile. If I hadn't acted quickly and screamed about a gas leak, I said, leaning forward on the table, there'd be dozens of families watching us and whatever the hell was captured in the middle of the streets, as in big-time public exposure. I think they'd be asking questions. You don't think they're still asking questions? My boss said. Do you know the favors we've had to call in from other agencies to give you a little improv performance legitimate cover? We wouldn't have been in that situation if we were told any details about this job. 
Those are need-to-know details, and that's above your pay grade, he said smugly. I sighed and reeled myself back in. I wasn't going to win this fight. If I was too aggressive, things would go from bad to worse. I was already skating on thin ice. No need to add any extra weight. I know, I finally said, but this one felt different. It was different, my boss said. The people who wanted the job done paid handsomely for it to be different. My job is to see that happen. Since you seem to need a reminder, your job is to do the work I give you and not worry about details. He smelled blood, and it was coming from me. I was worried about the safety of my team. That's all. They didn't seem to have the same concerns about you, he said. Maybe I'm destined for upper management, I said, hoping the levity would break the tension. The boss snorted. I wouldn't count on it. There was an awkward pause in the conversation. I honestly didn't know where this would land or where I wanted it to land. I had wanted to quit when it was over, but the hours in isolation made me think twice about it. While the chemicals did their best to scrub away whatever nastiness had glommed onto my body, I started thinking back to former teammates who hadn't succumbed to the frets. The guys that just left the job. I realized that I'd never heard from any of them again. I didn't even remember hearing their names whispered among the crews. They were just gone. A different kind of ghost. Where do we go from here? I finally asked. Job's not done. My boss said, you three need to finish what you started. Do Alpha and Omega know? They will, he said, standing. We'll have a driver take you to the last known location of the spectral energy. You'll trap it, bring it to the neighborhood, and release it without incident. Do you understand? I nodded. Good, he said. What if the gear can't handle the energy again? You saw what happened last time. You're going to roll out with our newest equipment. It hasn't been field tested, so for your sake, I hope it holds. Go gear up and rejoin your squad. This needs to be done yesterday. I stood and nodded again. As I turned to walk back out of the room, my boss cleared his throat. I turned back to him and he grinned. Also, the tests didn't come back as clean as you thought. They were inconclusive. We're rerunning them. Your team has been instructed to take any necessary actions if you show signs of the frets again. I swallowed hard and walked out of the room. About thirty minutes later, I had geared back up in our suits and spotted Alpha and Omega near the departure gate. They were speaking to each other in low tones and, when they spotted me, quickly moved away from one another. This job was going to be a nightmare. Omega and I hired in together and were mainly on the same wavelength. I hesitate to say we were friends because very few GCS agents were friends. We were friendly and said it was good enough. If we were in any other career, it was easy to imagine that we could have been close friends. But this job makes any real friendships hard. If you have to turn someone in because their mind is melting, it's easier to do if you keep things strictly professional. Alpha, on the other hand, was an asshole. Principled, yes, but about as welcoming as a rug burn. That being said, I had to admire their skill and leadership. While they had a prickly personality, there was no cooler customer in the field. I hated that I respected them as much as I did. But the truth was, they were the kind of person you'd want next to you in a foxhole. They shot straight were as blunt as a punch to the jaw, and did whatever they needed to ensure the job got done. They let you out, huh? Omega asked. We have to finish the job, I replied. Are you up for it? Alpha asked, eyeing me. I'm fine, swear to God. Why well, you're busy swearing to him, asking for a favor. I think we're going to need all the help we can get, Omega added. We heard the squelch of tires round the corner. A plain white work van stopped near us, and the back doors opened. Inside were a few tech guys who gave us a quick once-over on the new gear. 
Again, for NDA reasons, I can't get into specifics, but rest assured, it operated just like our old gear with a few tweaks. The nerds hopped out and we took their place inside the cramped little van. The driver came back and handed us blindfolds again. He was joined by a hulking beast of a man in the passenger seat with a gleaming MP5 turned on us. The gunman never spoke. He just pointed his gun barrel at us and watched as we tied the blindfolds over our eyes. Once he was satisfied that our eyes were adequately covered, the van's engine fired up, and we took off for our unknown destination. We were on the road for an hour, and nobody said a word. All you could hear was the rhythm of the road passing under our feet. Thump thump, thump thump. In a way, it echoed my own heartbeat. Steady, and ready for whatever awaited us at the ride's end. I tried to think of anything but the mission but I kept replaying the previous attempt in my mind. Last time, we ended up in the middle of the desert, where we encountered what looked like a living, pulsating birth canal. Worse, that birth canal spat out some exotic-looking creature none of us had ever seen before. That creature was powerful, so much so it burned out our gear and escaped into our world. All we knew about it was that it had five eyes and whistled loudly. The concrete underneath the wheels soon gave way to gravel and then dirt. The ride inside the van became unstable and bumpy. Wherever we were going was remote. I was glad it was in the middle of nowhere, because it was still light out. Three men in bio suits hauling sci-fi looking equipment around tend to draw a crowd. Again, I had issues with the assignment, but there was nothing I could do. For some reason, my brain flashed to an old documentary I'd seen a few years ago. In it, historians told of Aztec priests who would sacrifice men to assure their people the sun would rise that day. I envisioned myself on top of the ancient sept pyramids. The high altar peaked over the dense jungle trees. From this height, you could see the entire floor below us. Few people ever saw this magnificent sight. I was staring down at the teeming masses below. They bellowed, moaned, and screeched, but you couldn't make out any of their words. From this height, there was nothing more than cries to an unseen god. What chilled me about my vision, though, was my place in it. I wasn't sure if I was the executioner holding the axe, or the victim begging the gods that the axe man's aim was true. The van finally came to a stop. The engine never cut off, but I knew we had arrived. The passenger door opened, and we could feel the weight of the goon jostle the van as he got out. Seconds later, the back doors were opened. The gunman said gruffly, Step out and line up. Make any moves and we'll bury you here. We did as we were told. The gunman walked up and held the gun close to my face. The smell of machined metal filled my nostrils and I knew the first thing he wanted me to see when I removed my blindfold was the business end of that MP5. It was an unorthodox way of enforcing rules, but it got the job done. Take him off, he said. We did. Not surprisingly, I saw the gun aimed square at my face. I could feel the sweat starting to moisten my face, but I didn't want to show him I was nervous. I didn't want my squad to see that either. Being nervous and doing this line of work is not a good combination. That goes double if there are some lingering doubts about your sanity. You can put that down, I said, keeping my voice steady. The gunman ignored me. He turned to Alpha and Omega. He gets out of line. You have your orders. Alpha nodded instantly. Omega gave me a further glance before looking down and nodding in agreement. Happy with this response, the gunman pointed his weapon at his side. I felt my whole body unclench. You have two hours to track this thing and bring it back. There may be a group of hikers out there. Our recon team didn't have enough time to do a proper survey. Do not let anyone spot you. What happens if someone does? Omega asked. They don't make it back to the trailhead, the gunman said without hesitation. The pay for this one must be out of this world, because murder was officially on the table. I felt sick to my stomach, the gunman continued. If you're not back here in two hours, we'll assume the worst and leave. Now unload the gear and get moving. We did it as quickly as possible. If anyone wanted to ask any further questions, there wasn't any chance to. The gunman didn't let us respond to anything. 
He calmly walks back into the van and slams the door. Once our gear was out, the van shifted into drive and rocketed off. It kicked dust on us as it did so. Where the hell are we? Omega asked, taking in the scenery. This sure as shit ain't the desert. Or a suburban neighborhood, I said. How far did this thing travel? Whatever it is, it moves quickly and quietly, Alpha said, adding. My guess is it's adept at hiding, probably why it came out here. Out here was a dense conifer forest in the foothills of a mountain range. We all knew this was a reasonable distance from where we had first found the spirits we were now tasked with recapturing. The fact that it had managed to escape our energy containment packs spoke volumes about its capabilities to adapt to our world. Did you guys get any new information about the energy? I asked. Alpha and Omega looked at each other and didn't respond. The glands told me they had, but weren't going to share. I sighed. How are we going to be able to do this job if you two are keeping secrets? How are we going to do the job if you have the frets? Alpha said, matter-of-factly. The test came back fine. I lied. No reason to give them ammunition if I didn't have to. You heard the voices, man, Omega said. It's worrisome. The tests were clean. The company sent me back out into the field. Never mind that I was correct. The voices were leaks from our gear. Still, Omega offered. I cut him off. You guys do remember the equipment blowing up because of leaking spectral energy, right? Do you also remember how I saved us from dying? If I had the frets, would I bother? What more do I have to do to prove that I'm good? You can't. Not with me, at least. Alpha said. I'm not judging you personally. It's business. I want to get home tonight in one piece. If your brain's melting, that makes my goal harder to achieve. Fine, I said, realizing Alpha wasn't going to change their mind. Don't want to trust me? Whatever. But if there are mission-critical details I need to know, you have to tell me. I can't be any help if I'm in the dark. That's valid, Omega said. If this thing gets water of both of us, Gamma needs to know what they're dealing with. We can't get saved if some of the squad is in the dark. If that thing gets any of us, we're all done for, Alpha said. I threw up my hands in frustration. I'll just stay here and let you two pros go into the bush and extract it yourselves, okay? Make you both feel better? No. Omega finally said. He glanced at Alpha, who reluctantly nodded in agreement. We need your help. So? What's going on? What's new information? It's nothing official, Alpha said. Scuttlebutt we heard back at HQ. Omega offered. So they didn't officially tell you two anything, huh? They've still kept their cards close to the vest, Omega said. What are the rumors? This thing isn't for my dimension, Alpha said. Someone tampered with some shit and found a way to open a portal here. Jesus, I said. Yeah, if we only had his powers, we might get through this. Omega joked. Who tampered? Who knows, Omega said, above my pay grade. Why were we supposed to release this into a suburban neighborhood? I heard it was a revenge plan from the benefactor, Omega said. Who's the benefactor that paid for that? And how black is their heart? No one's talking, Alpha said. Jet black by the sound of it, Omega said with a shrug. Nothing here makes sense. Why the instants on a smaller team? Why blindfold us? This has got to be government, right? Maybe. Omega said. Could be a big organization, too. Religious group, maybe. Or a Fortune 500 company with deep pockets and no scruples. So, every company, I offered. Omega laughed. Alpha didn't. We never go in the know, and it's useless to waste time griping about it. Alpha said. We should head out and try to track this thing down before the van gets back. I hated to agree, but Alpha was right. The company had put us on a ticking clock, and we were losing precious time talking. All that being said, I was glad the coldness between us had thawed some. I didn't do anything wrong, and didn't enjoy feeling like I had to constantly defend my actions. Are we sure this equipment will even work? Omega asked. No, Alpha said. 
But we don't have any other choice at the moment. I think we should follow north along this sliver of a trail here. Not sure what this thing is or how it operates, but maybe it follows a path of least resistance when it moves. Assume it can't just phase through things? Alpha said. But that's as good a guess as any I have. Let's suit up and hit the trail. We did. The new equipment was a touch heavier, but that was to be expected. I can't go into details about our gear, but each generation added more weights as well as bells and whistles. We didn't even get a detailed rundown of any new tweaks to this stuff. They just told us it should handle the energy better. Should. Not that it would. We wouldn't know until we recaptured this thing. The spectral energy we were chasing was unlike anything we'd seen before. At the outset, we assumed it would act within the parameters of what all free-floating spirits behaved like. That didn't happen. It was different. We didn't know much, except it was a bitch to deal with, and was probably dangerous. Adding a degree of difficulty to the whole shebang, this thing might not even be native to our world. We had watched it get violently burst, and so far it seemed it wasn't enjoying its time here. It didn't look or sound like any energy we'd ever experienced. It left us in the dark, and even with all our combined expertise on this job, everything was an educated guess. Alpha mentioned phasing, moving through solid objects to the layman, but we hadn't witnessed it. Was it capable of that? Maybe, but we'd have to see it to know for sure. What filled me with dread was not knowing what else it could do. We walked along what looked like a rutted animal trail for what felt like twenty minutes or so. Around us, the trees densely thickened, and the deeper we went, the darker it got. Every once in a while, when the wind blew off the mountain, the canopies would part and let in a ray of midday sunlight. If you were this thing, where would you be? There's so many places to hide out here, Alpha said. It could be watching us now. Just then, we heard a ping from our equipment. It was a gizmo on our packs that detected excess spectral energy in the wild. I mostly kept mine toggled off. It was annoying. We all stopped and craned our necks towards the tops of the trees. We were looking for any telltale signs of a ghost, but were coming up empty. After a beat, Omega shrugged. Maybe the machine was auto-calibrating. Maybe, Alpha said, less confident. My eyes caught the glimmer of the sun off of something about a hundred yards away. It wasn't spectral, but something somebody had left behind on this trail. I pointed towards it and brought it to my team's attention. What's that? Not our thing, Alpha said. So who cares? It looks like something metallic. Let's go take a look, Omega said, taking a step in that direction. We resumed our journey, albeit at a quicker pace than we had been before. We got to a patch of waving green weeds and found the shining object we had clocked from the trail. I picked it up and held it out for everyone to see. It was an old canteen. The words, Martyr's Blood, were stenciled along the side in fading white paint. I shook it, and we heard the sloshing of water inside. Martyr's blood? I said, confused. Ah, oh, shit. Omega said, their face brightening with remembrance. I can't believe that's where we are. Where are we? We have to be near the compound, Alpha said. Then it clicked in my brain. Martyr's blood was a religious sect that worshipped someone they called the Bleeding Man. They tried to forge a living deep inside of these mountains in the early 1950s. They had cleared away a bunch of trees and erected some housing and a church. They wanted to escape the corrupting nature of man and await the bleeding man's return, in the warm embrace of his creation. His arrival would announce the coming end of the world. His true believers would be spared and helped to create the new world. Instead, they all committed mass suicide three months later. Being near the compound was not going to make for a fun adventure. The sheer mass of people who died here, 55 if I remember correctly, could have left a surge of spectral energy left to roil out here for decades unabated. It might be looking for an outlet to infect. Imagine a rogue wave in the ocean arising from the depths and swamping a beach town. We were the beach town. This isn't good, I said, declaring the obvious. 
Maybe it came out here because it's attracted to spectral energy. Omega said. A cannibalizing ghost, Alpha said before adding. Gray. What would it need the energy for? I asked. What the fuck is that? Alpha said, walking past me. I dropped the canteen and followed behind him. Omega followed behind me, and we walked like two baby ducks swaddling after our inquisitive mother. We didn't have to travel far to get a closer look at what Alpha had seen. We had spotted the rotting remains of the church. But while the old brick and wood house of worship was attractive in its own right, what caught their attention was a deep groove slashed across the front door. The groove was fresh. You could still smell the cut pine, and there were curls of wood at the bottom of the entryway. This had just happened. Our spirit was here, and it was acting out. I can't go into specifics for obvious reasons, but I can say that spectral energy is mostly inert until acted upon. It can stay in a location, move, glow, and make noise, but doesn't typically lash out violently at things. It might knock things around like a bumbling dog or a passive-aggressive cat, but it does not attack. It's why the extraction process is typically uneventful. I won't say safe, because energy is a fickle thing, and a typical day can become a headline in the blink of an eye. But for the most part, it's not a front-of-brain concern. This slashed door was. It told us that either this thing had attacked something, or had been attacked, and defended itself. Either way, it made things a lot more dangerous, as if we needed a force multiplier with this unknown creature. Ain't that grand, Omega said. Pretty far from grand, I echoed. What got this thing hot? Maybe the three extraction squad members chasing it. No, Alpha said. It's not us. It's the others here. We don't know for sure if there are, Omega said. Yes, we do, Alpha said. There's a change in the air. Can't you feel it? No, I said. I don't. Me either, Omega confirmed. Even if you don't feel it yet, Alpha said, a little more defensively than he wanted. You know we will. This was a mass trauma site. There's bound to be free-floating spectral energy here. Probably full-formed apparitions, too. I don't doubt it, I said. But until we all see or feel them, we can't assume anything. We'll be against the rules and all. Not going to lie, that was fun to say to them. Regardless, Omega said, refocusing us. Whatever this thing is... He can lash out in a very real way. If it sliced a door, it could slice our bodies. I gotta say, this door has tipped me fully into the we're not dealing with a typical ghost camp, I said. I thought the same thing, Omega said. Me too, Alpha said with some reluctance. But if it's not spectral energy, what is it? Maybe it's a ghost, but not one from this dimension, I said. Alpha and Omega looked at each other, and then back at me. What? Omega asked. Scuttlebutt was this might have come from another dimension. When we hear another dimension, we instantly assume it's a physical being, right? Who else but living, breathing creatures operate machines? Okay, Omega said. What are you suggesting, then? I'm thinking, what if it's not a living creature, but sentient spectral energy from some other world? Instead of phasing through a wall or whatever, it's phased through space-time. Holy shit, Alpha said. I smiled. Kind of crazy, right? But their amazement was not for me. Behind me, Alpha had spotted a faint blue light pulsating in the ruins of an old house 15 feet from us. We all turned and watched as the light peeked out from the glass-led window opening. The light wasn't in any definite shape, but it was clearly looking for something. It was joined by three other light beings looking out the window. They instantly winked out a few seconds later, leaving the house dark again. Well, that answers that question, Omega said. I told you guys there'd be free-floating energy here. They were looking for something, I said. I think you're onto something, Alpha. This thing might want the energy as much as we do. The real question is why, Alpha said. And what happens when it gets that energy? We all stared at each other, and without speaking a word, all had the same thought. 
We cannot, under any circumstances, let this thing siphon off any energy here. It was already more potent than anything we've ever dealt with. We didn't need to pour kerosene on an open flame. What's the game plan? I asked. We should spread out, try to find where this thing might be, Alpha said. I mean, we could, but is that smart? Won't we be easy pickings one-on-one -on -one with this thing? Assume it can attack us, Alpha said. I laughed. I couldn't help it. They both turned their heads toward me. I nodded at the door. I think it's safe to assume that this thing can attack us if it wants. It already charged me once, and now we know it has door mauling claws attached to its body. Besides, Omega said, you're the only extractor here, Alpha. If we see it and want to snag it, we couldn't. I'm the lead extractor, but you guys trains to do it too if the need arises. My training was ten years ago, I said. Besides, our tools aren't extraction tools. I think these new packs might be all in one. Look at the dials at the top, Alpha said, pointing to a previously overlooked tweak to our gear. I think if you flip the switches here, you can use the extractor or release. What's the third option? I said, pointing to a skull icon. That's for when we decide to turn these things on ourselves, Omega said with a laugh. They really have thought of everything, I said. Shh, Alpha said. Listen, do you hear that? We shut up, and our ears were flooded with the sounds of Mother Nature, but nothing else. After a few seconds, Omega added their voice to the noise. What are we listening for? Whispers, Alpha said. They're talking to each other. Now it was time for Omega and me to look at each other. Hearing whispers is a sign of the frets, but I had heard whispers too. As much as I wanted to take my smug co-worker down a peg or two, I wasn't rushing to judge. I was in their place once, and still was, if I was being honest, and hated being there. Who's talking? I said. Not sure. Where is it coming from? Omega asked. Kind of everywhere, Alpha said, their face scrunched in concentration. But if I listen in different areas, I kind of pick up different snippets. It's like fine-tuning a car radio. It's all static until you find a station. There was a strong gust of wind, and the trunks of the pines swayed. A blizzard of dry pine needles was shaken loose and fell on us like alien snowflakes. With all the swaying, the canopy opened up some and allowed more lights to shine down into the clearing. For the first time... I could take in the size of the Martyr's Blood compound. It was larger than I had imagined. There had to be a lot of spectral energy out here. The compound had about a dozen or so buildings, still standing by sheer force of will and little else. They were mostly made from river rock and timber, and, as a result, had started to rot. Of the buildings still upright, few had kept their roofs. Most had collapsed in on themselves. We assumed these buildings were probably housing for the cult members. They all looked like they had come out of a Play-Doh press. Soft, pliable, but uniform. Several other buildings were nothing more than skeletal remains that nature had reclaimed years ago. I thought about how hard it must have been to carve out a little piece of civilization here in the wild. The months of hard labor and sweats and toil and calloused hands these pilgrims must have endured was awe-inspiring. I thought about the pride they experienced when the job was finished, the relief they must have felt that their hard work had paid off, their beliefs panned out. They had supplanted the natural world in a hostile and unforgiving place. Then, with nothing more than time and patience, nature clawed most of it back. In another decade, there wouldn't be any trace that anyone had ever lived here. You could hike right over the ruins and never know that civilization was buried just below the surface. Nature had seen the hubris of man and laughed. On the breeze, I heard a faint whistle off in the distance. I felt the hairs on my neck stand up on end, because I knew what that was. The creature we'd been tracking was nearby. I turned to both of my squad mates, and the fear splashed across their faces told me they had heard the whistle, too. Is that... Omega started but didn't finish. 
we all knew what it was. Where? I said so softly, I was afraid the swaying of the pines would drown it out. Fifty feet away and thirty feet up, Alpha said, craning their neck up the tree. See anything? Before Alpha parted their lips to speak, another whistle started blowing. It was closer this time. I felt my skin shiver and goose pimple. I scanned around, looking for any sign of the creature, but wherever it was hiding, it was doing a damn fine job of it. It's at least ten feet closer, Mega whispered. Fifteen, Alpha responded, doing nothing to calm our fears. Is it in the trees still? I asked. Shh, Alpha said as they crouched closer to the ground. I glanced over at Omega, who shrugged. Alpha was slowly turning their head, listening for a radio station to break through the static. I turned my ear in their direction and tried to find any whispering, but I came up empty. I was starting to doubt Alpha could hear anything, but then their body went still and straight like a pointer finding a duck. Without warning, Alpha slowly started stripping off their extraction packs. What the fuck are you doing? I asked in an angry whisper. I'm getting closer. Why are you taking off your gear? Don't want to draw attention. I wanted to say more, but Omega put a hand on my shoulder. I glanced over at them, and they just shook their head. No. It wasn't worth trying to talk sense to Alpha. Either they were onto something, or their mind had started to go. Instead, Omega and I flipped the dials on our weapons to extract and aimed them over our clawing colleague. If something emerged in front of Alpha, we would provide them some cover to scramble back. Alpha inched along the ground, doing their best not to make a sound. I kept scanning the area in front of them for anything out of the ordinary, but I was coming up empty. I squatted to see if I could hear something now, but that too yielded no results. Alpha reached into his pocket and pulled out a small device I had never seen before. The device was tiny and fit in the palm of their hand. It was metallic gray and circular in shape, with what looked like a clear crystal jammed in the center of the circle. If you've seen those Christmas cookies with the Hershey's Kisses in the middle, it was like that, only with futuristic technology and not a delicious treat. The hell is that? I whispered to Omega. New tech, they responded. I don't have one of those, I said. I don't either. Alpha placed the gizmo on the ground and flipped a switch. At first, nothing happened, and I was worried that if this new tech didn't work, maybe none of the latest gear worked. That would mean the packs we were hauling were nothing more than the world's most expensive paperweights. But then the crystal started glowing white. Alpha scooted back a lot quicker than they had crawled out there. They mimed that we should shut our eyes when they got near us. I did but I still managed to see a flash through my eyelids. An intense spark of light was gone as quickly as it arrived. When I thought the danger of blindness had gone away, I opened my eyes, and my jaw dropped. A white light beam pulsated like it had just found its heartbeat. More than that, a beam of light about twenty feet long shot out from the crystal's side. The beam of light whirled around in a circle, creating a strobe effect as it whipped around the compound. The crystal's light beam would resemble a radar screen if you were in the canopy looking down. As astonishing as this piece of gear was, what it was pinging was something no radar screen would ever be able to record. As the light whipped around the twenty-foot radius, it would momentarily light up ghostly figures near the building. These free-floating energy figures all looked radically different. Some were mere blobs hovering over the grass, while others looked like a person's silhouette. As soon as the light passed these outlines, they disappeared again, until the light made its trip back around. I started counting the figures just in the field in front of us. There were at least ten in that radius alone. Holy shit, I said. Where'd you get that? Omega asked. The boss gave it to me back at HQ, Alpha said. Why didn't he give us one? Maybe he didn't trust you to. Why wouldn't you trust me? Omega asked. Where's our creature? I asked. Can it detect that energy? I don't know, 
Officer, they said this was new tech and could be unstable. What does that mean? Omega asked. It could break, I said. Or explode, Alpha said, confirming our fears. Why are we using it so close to where we're standing? Because we came out here to do a job, and we're gonna do it. So far, slinking around this ghost town hasn't led to shit. Time to kick things up a notch, Alpha said, his voice breaking out of a whisper. We weren't the only two to notice their rising anger. As the beacon spun, the figures all seemed to turn towards us. We had been spotted by the ghost horde. I looked at our gear's energy capacity and did a little on-the-fly math. If these things got hostile, we would never be able to capture them all before they override us. They had the upper hand. Keep it down, Omega said. Why are you two questioning my methods? Alpha asked. Because it seems like you were given more information and gear than we were, Omega said. You both were, I corrected. Before we could get into how the company was playing us off one another, we heard an ear-piercing whistle from the trees directly in front of us. I glanced up and felt my chest tighten as I saw the five red eyes from this creature wink into view. I aimed my extractor towards it, but it was too late. The creature leapt from the trees and landed directly on top of our beacon. Oh shit, is all I heard Alpha say as the crystal broke sending out a blast of energy that knocked us all back five feet in the air. I landed with a back-cracking thud on my pack, and the pain in my spine was instant and searing. My hearing had also gone wonky from the explosion, and I was only picking up snippets of sound. What I did hear was distorted and muffled, but even over the internal din of my ringing ears, I heard the whistle of the creature, followed by several sickening popping sounds. I struggled to sit up to get a better view of what was going on, I was in real pain, and moving was difficult, but if I didn't, I'd die. Imminent's death is a real motivator. I slid my pack off to lighten the load and sat up. About twenty yards in front of me, I saw our creature again like I had on that neighborhood street only hours earlier. It was as ugly as I remembered, but seeing it this time, I was pretty sure I wasn't looking at a ghost. Not like we know them. This thing had five eyes encircling its head but they were also attached to a flap of skin that could peel off the scalp and move the eyes to give it 360-degree vision. It was hunched over, but you could tell it was tall. I thought maybe seven feet. It was bipedal, and I knew it was fast because it nearly ran me over earlier. The creature's skin was greenish-gray at the moment, but it swirled like smoke on the water. My gut feeling was that it had the ability to blend into its surroundings like a chameleon. There were four arms, two smaller ones, and two larger ones. The larger arms extended its razor-sharp claws. It emitted a soft blue light. At first, I thought it might naturally be bioluminescent, but when I had seen it in the dark before, there had never been a glow. While trying to puzzle out why the creature was suddenly glowing, I watched it leap through the air and land on a fully formed spectral figure. I had expected our creature to pass right through the ghost's energy, but something strange happened when it touched the energy. The ghost seemed to stiffen and harden. The creature's chest peeled open, and a fleshy tube emerged and tapped the now frozen ghost. It popped like a balloon, and the fleshy straw sucked in the free-floating energy with a sickening slurp. It sounded like when a wet vacuum sucked up a dry puddle. The creature's tube folded back into its body, as the chest closed back up. The creature's glow was a noticeably darker shade of blue. Then, it clicked as to what the fuck had just happened, and what this thing was. It was glowing because it had captured one of these ghosts. It had somehow absorbed the energy. It was an extractor. It was just like me. Like us. The creature let out a scream with four distinct human voices and leapt ten feet to the top of the church ruins. It whistled, and then disappeared from my view. Either it was gone, or it was hiding. Regardless, I knew we'd never be able to stop this thing. I finally glanced over to my left, and saw Omega struggling to move. I ran over to them, and saw an open gash had been ripped open across their forehead. It should have been bleeding profusely, but because the impact on the ground had been so intense, the wound was jammed with dirt and debris. 
It was going to take a lot of work to clean it out. You okay? I said. Omega nodded and finally said, Gamma, help me sit up. I did. How are you feeling? Omega touched their head and saw the blood. Besides the headache, Peachy, where's Alpha? I glanced back to my right and saw Alpha's body in a crumpled heap at the base of a large pine. I looked down at Omega, and they nodded. I left them and made my way over to Alpha. Hey, hey, you okay? There wasn't a response. I grabbed their shoulder and pulled them onto their back, but Alpha didn't move on their own accord. Their body jostled and slouched like a rag doll. I assumed the worst. I checked for a pulse and felt some relief. Alpha was still alive. Can you hear me? I said, giving their cheeks a slight slap. Finally, Alpha gasped and sat up like they'd just been hit with a cattle prod. I backed away out of fear, but when we locked eyes, I relaxed. For a beat. Then I got a good look at their eyes. Their pupils looked like they were vibrating back and forth at an unnatural speed. I assumed there was no way they'd be able to focus on anything. At best, he was severely concussed. At worst, they really did have the frets. I didn't want to believe that. Hey, you okay? Yeah, Alpha said flatly. You sure? No, they finally said, rubbing their head. I think you might have a concussion, I said. Your eyes are shaken, man. My eyes are fine, Alpha said. Are you sure? Yes, Alpha said, struggling to stand. I put my hand on their shoulder. Hold on a second. You might be hurt. You took the blunt of that explosion. We have to stop it, they said, shaking the cobwebs from their brain. We will, I said, not really believing that myself. If that thing can absorb energy, it might be able to release it, too. The weight of that statement hit me. Energy doesn't just die. It transfers. I had just seen it hoover up some long-dead martyr's blood member into its chest. I had heard several pops. It was filling up with energy. If something ignited that energy, it'd be a living time bomb. I said... Alpha tried to stand, but their wobbly legs refused to work properly, and sent them back down to their ass. I put my arm on their shoulder and looked at their manic eyes. You can't move. I think you've been concussed and might have internal bleeding. Just stay here, and Omega and I will handle everything, okay? We have to get it, Alpha said. We'll try. The voices, they said, trailing off. What voices? They're saying something, but I can't make it out. Swirl? Does that make sense? It didn't. I nodded at Alpha. You stay put and listen, okay? You hear me? Alpha nodded. They weren't going to be of any use to us. Alpha's brain was scrambled. I was worried they'd act erratic if they went with us. Any misstep now could be disastrous, and I wasn't going to die in these woods. No fucking way. We have to send it back, Alpha said, staring into the middle distance. I nodded and hustled back over to Omega. They were standing now. They nodded over to Alpha, who was lost in their own thoughts. Where's the scoop? Concussion at best, frets at worst. Fuck. That about covers it, I said. What should we do? After a few seconds of silence, I sighed. I think... I think we have to try to capture this thing. Fuck. I know, I said. But we saw this thing not only can see, but devour spectral energy. Nothing we've ever dealt with has ever done that. This can't be from our world, Omega said, supporting my earlier epiphany. I agree, I said. But if it can eat energy, it means it's storing energy. And that energy has to go somewhere. It has to do something. Can it expel it? Maybe, I said. I don't know. Maybe it uses it to mutate or grow or become more lethal or... Or 
There are a million things. Who the fuck wanted this thing in our world? Some sadistic asshole, I said. They wanted to put this thing in a neighborhood, around families. I know, I said. What about the martyr's blood ghosts? Omega said. How will they respond to something attacking them? I mean, they didn't do much of anything with us. But that's because the energy isn't aware of our purpose. They know that thing is going to hunt them. Will they attack? Can they? Man, this shit wasn't covered in orientation. I have no clue. Maybe we should just leave. Omega said. Drag Alpha out of here. Tell them they need to send in more guys. The air was suddenly punctured by the primal and fearful screaming of a man on the edge of sanity. I glanced back over at Alpha. He wasn't the one making the noise. What the hell is that? Omega said, their eyes going wide with concern. Power up your gear, I said, flipping the dials on mine. It hummed to life. Was that the creature? I don't think so, I said, which is slightly disconcerting. Omega's gear hums to life. Bit of an understatement. Where did it come from? Not sure, Omega said. Seemed to be coming in all directions. The screams came again. It was a male's voice, and they sounded like they were in pain. The yelling ricocheted off all ruins around us. I glanced at Omega, who was visually shaking. This person had been on over 50 missions and never broke a sweat. They had nerves of steel. But now... They were shaking. I think it's coming from behind that row of cabins, I whispered. What is it? I ignored the question. We should flank it from either side. You want to split up? No, I said. But I want to capture whatever it is. I mean, fuck it. Let's capture as much as we can. If we have the energy, the creature can't get it. Unless it gets us, too. I swallowed. I thought that horrible thought too, but I had the courtesy to keep it to myself. I needed Omega to be present and aware so I wouldn't get mauled by some monster. I needed to break the tension. Hey, don't be a Debbie Downer, huh? We got this. Omega gave me a weak smile. I gave him one back. Neither of us wanted to do this, but this was the job. If we didn't hop on this grenade, someone else would have to later. A new crew would be going in blind. We had a slight advantage that we knew what this thing could do, and how it acted. What we didn't know was what the hell was hollering behind the cabins. I wasn't sure if it was our creature, though. The last time we saw that thing, it was perched on top of the church ruins, like the world's ugliest gargoyle. This could be something new. Just our luck. You ready? I asked Omega. They nodded. If you see anything, blast away, I said. Just be careful not to hit me. If anything attacks me, aim for my heart, yeah. I swallowed and nodded. I pointed for Omega to flank her on the left, and I would go right. We were going to have to try to be as quiet as possible to not give away our position to whatever was screaming behind the buildings. It felt weird thinking I had to try to hide from a ghost. In most scenarios, it was the other way around. But here I was doing just that. Life is a mystery. I took my steps as softly as the kids sneaking out of their bedroom. I made sure to avoid any sticks or piles of dead leaves. Didn't need to have a snapping twig reveal my location to something that might be able to murder me. I also slowed down my breathing as best as I could. If my adrenaline was spiking, I'd make mistakes. Mistakes can be deadly. In times like this, I found it comforting to repeat a little mantra to keep myself centered. It was dumb, but it worked for me. As quiet as a mumbled birthday wish, I repeated the phrase, You're the true energy, over and over. Instead of worrying about what ghoulish shit was awaiting me around the corner, I focused my energy on just four little words. I got to the corner of one of the cabins and stopped. I double-checked my gear and exhaled. I was about to turn around the corner to confront whatever had started painfully screaming mere minutes ago, when suddenly, everything around faded to total darkness. It was like someone had turned a dimmer switch all the way down. But it didn't make any sense. It was still in the middle of the afternoon. I craned my head towards the sky to see if I could spot the sun. Even with the dense tree canopy, some light always broke through. But now there wasn't anything. It had become the middle of the night in the middle of the day. 
The idea of an eclipse came rushing to my head, but I didn't remember hearing anything about one occurring today. Holy shit, holy shit, holy shit. I heard Alpha scream from behind me. I wheeled around and saw what had prompted his sudden fit. Twenty or so ghostly figures were marching in a circle in the clearing between us. Unlike before, you could very clearly make out each human form. As they moved, they created a low humming that filled the air. With my attention on this impromptu ghost parade, I felt a hot breath on the back of my neck. My heart started racing, and the hair on my arms stood on end. I didn't know what was behind me. It could have been our creature, a martyr's blood spirit, the screaming man or some other undiscovered horror. Worse, even if I turned around to get a glimpse, I wouldn't be able to see it because of the total darkness. At that moment, it somehow got darker outside. I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. I assumed whatever was behind me couldn't see anything either, or I at least hoped that was the case. I was frozen in place. If I moved or made a noise, whatever was behind me might attack. Then, I heard it whistle. It wasn't the long, loud blasts they had done before. It was several short bursts, a pause, then several more bursts. I wasn't sure what it was doing, but I knew what it was now. Our creature was directly behind me. I squeezed my eyes shut tight, as if doing so would suddenly make everything go back to normal. I could feel my heart exploding out of my chest and hear my blood whooshing in my ears. My legs went numb and I was afraid I might pass out. In my mind, I repeated my mantra over and over, but it was failing me. I opened my eyes back up. It seemed darker still. The humming from the circling ghosts were louder now. The creature did three more short blasts, and it suddenly clicked why they were doing it. It was probably some kind of echolocation, which meant it had to know I was there. Sweat beaded on my forehead. My legs burned from being still. I was trying to keep my breath shallow and controlled, but I was losing that battle. It had to hear me. It had to know I was there. But why hadn't it attacked? I decided to make a bold move and try to step away from this thing. I couldn't see the building next to me, but I knew it was there. I thought I would be safe if I could quietly and methodically move my body toward the wall, get some breathing room between us. I knew the chances of doing this silently were slim, but I didn't know what else to do. While debating how I would get out of this mess, I heard the man behind the cabins scream again. Out of instinct, I turned to see him, not remembering something was standing right behind me. As soon as I wheeled around, the memory broke through my natural instincts. I thought I was fucked and felt my hand get dizzy. Only when I turned around, there wasn't anything there. No breathing. No echolocation whistles. No presence. I reached my trembling hand out and didn't feel anything. The space in front of me was empty. The creature was gone. Fuck you. Omega yelled and fired off his weapon. I saw the blue arc from the extractor gun blast across the sky and slam into the tree line. Omega had missed whatever they had been aiming at. I ran around the building, and in the dim light of the crackling extractor beams, I saw Omega screaming as he blasted away at something I couldn't see. What's going on? I yelled. Omega's finger moved off the switch, and the arching green light ceased to exist. We were entirely in the dark again. I could hear Omega's heavy breathing. They were panicked. I was worried they might pass out. What's going on? I repeated. It was behind me. I felt its breath. It ran after the screaming. I just started firing. My blood ran cold. How could this creature have been in two places at once? It couldn't have been. Did I imagine it the whole time? Or had Omega been imagining it? Did I have the frets? Did Omega? I had to know. Are you okay? I asked. Are you fucking serious right now? I was about to respond when the humming sound burst through and filled the air around us. If a hiker was passing by, they'd swear it was a hive of bees, but we both knew that wasn't the case. Back between the cabins, the blue figures had started spinning faster. I thought of sheep as they herded in circles, only there wasn't a shepherd for this flock. 
these ghost figures were moving so quickly now that you couldn't make out any individual ghosts. It looked like a solid wall of blue light. The middle of the ghost circle started to crackle with white lightning. The energy being whipped up was unlike anything I'd ever seen. My hair began to stand on end from the static charge. I checked my gear, and the lights were pulsating like there was an overload. I ran over to Omega and pulled them close. What the fuck are they doing? I screamed over the growing noise. Omega didn't respond. Their eyes were transfixed on the glowing electrical storm in the clearing. I don't think Omega blinked, because their eyes started watering. They were so afraid to look away, they had forgotten to do the most basic human movements. I slapped them across the face, which seemed to snap the spell. We shared a glance of concern. In that look, we knew there wasn't anything we were going to be able to do. I felt the word run rising in my throat, but my mouth wouldn't spit it out. We should go. Omega finally spat out. What about Alpha? Alpha has the frets. Has to, right? I don't know, I said. They might not even be alive, Omega said. Alpha was shaken up bad from the explosion. We can't leave someone behind. Alpha would have killed you where you stand, Omega said. But they didn't. Omega shook their head. You're too noble. No, I'm scared as fuck, I said. And if I'm scared as fuck back here, Alpha has to be melting down over there. We're the ones the whistling knife blade monster lured into the darkness with a fake goddamn human screaming. I'm melting down. Fuck Alpha. I get it. I know. Trust me. I said, trying to talk them down. I nodded towards the lightning storm. But we're not Alpha. We don't leave people behind. As much as Omega hated to admit it, I had a point. Alpha, despite being an asshole, was our comrade in arms. This job is a killer. It strips you of your humanity, separates you from your family. It isolates you in ways you can never recover from. If you're here long enough, the energy from the work can quite literally kill you. The people that work it are from a stock that doesn't fit into the regular world. We're a rare breed never considered for mass production. Alpha was owed a fighting chance, whether the frets had gripped their minds or not. They didn't deserve to be left behind, to be killed by ghosts or a monster in a former cult's compound. What do we do? Omega asked. Pray, I said, before adding. Let's head around the cabins and sprint to the tree line. We'll drag Alpha out here and wait for the van. What if our creature finds us? I said pray already, right? Omega gave me a small smile. It was enough. We took off from where I had come from and turned the corner of the ruins. We slowly made our way behind the stone wall until we reached the edge. I peered out and saw the blue lights and crackling lightning. Both were growing more intense. Something's up. I screamed over the humming, which had been so loud it drowned out any other noise. That's when the blue ghosts blinked away. The whirling blue wheel of light was gone leaving only a shimmering blue-green circle on the ground. Worse, everything around us went quiet. No more humming, no birds chirping, no trees blowing in the breeze. Nothing. I felt the weight of something heavy hitting the ground before I saw its soft blue outline and five red eyes. The creature had leapt from the tops of the trees between Alpha and us, right near the shimmering hole in the ground. I swallowed hard. Alpha had seen us, or I thought they had, but I could do nothing. If I started waving, I might draw the attention of one of the five eyes. If the creature came at me with claws poised to strike, I'd get about five feet away before those Ginsus turned me into shredded beef in the blink of an eye. Same for Alpha, only they wouldn't be able to even try to run away if the creature came for them. We were going to have to wait and watch. I double-checked my gear. It was still an extraction mode. I might be able to snag that thing into the pack, but I didn't know how long it would stay in there. The new packs had higher capacity, but the creature's energy had only increased since we last fought it. Hey! Hey! Alpha started screaming. I felt the bottom of my stomach drop out. What the hell were they doing? I wanted to yell for them to shut up, but I couldn't. The creature turned its head towards Alpha. My heart started jackhammering in my chest. 
What the fuck were they doing? I tightened my grip on the extractor gun and raised the sights up. Even in the low lights, I saw Omega raise their gun. There's a danger in two different extractors tagging the same ghost and pulling in two opposite directions. It's really similar to when someone splits an atom. But at that moment, we were ready to go full Oppenheimer. I heard a stone wall collapse before I felt the earth shaking. The thudding of heavy river rocks slamming into the soft ground was followed by vibrations racing up my body. Earthquakes aren't unusual in this part of the country, but this wasn't an earthquake. This seismic shimmying was from something not of this earth arriving. A blast of pure white light exploded into the clouds from the middle of the shimmering hole in the ground. Both Omega and I shielded our eyes and fell to the ground. Going from near total darkness to the surface of the sun burned my rods and cones. The blast of light was followed by a sonic boom that shook the remaining ruins to the ground. I covered my head and neck, and the rocks collapsed on me. One hit my back, and I heard the sickening snap of a rib before my muscles squeezed me tighter than a coked-up anaconda. I let out a painful moan, but it was blotted out by the rumble of something big coming out of that hole in the ground. Still stunned, I pushed the rocks off of me and rubbed my eyes. I opened them, but my vision was still off-kilter. It felt like trying to watch a movie through a scrambled cable channel. You could see bits and pieces, but never get the whole image. Omega, you okay? After a few seconds, I heard a groan and rocks clattering. I've been better, they said. I rubbed my eyes again, trying to chase away the floaters and mostly failing. When I finally did pry them back open, I noticed the darkness around us had lifted. The sun was streaming back down. I heard birds in the trees. The world seemed to return to normal. I shuffled to my feet, but almost immediately ducked back down. Our creature was gone, but there was something wicked in its place. Standing aside the hole was the figure of a man about fifteen feet tall. He was as wide as a city bus, with arms like tree trunks. He had all black eyes and a row of teeth so pointy it looked like a cave of daggers. His hair looked like bolts of lightning frozen in lucite. He was completely covered in blood. It was the bleeding man. The viscous red ooze leaked out of the open wounds on the bleeding man's head and trickled down his gnarled face and onto his carved and bleeding chest. He stood with his arms held down by his sides, palms up. It reminded me of a priest supplicating to a high holy man. The oozing blood left a red trail down those ropey arms until it pooled into his palms. It trickled through his fingers and dropped onto the ground, staining it crimson. Holy shit, I mumbled. I tried to stay low, but there wasn't anywhere to hide behind anymore. The force of the boom had knocked all the structures down. Omega scrambled over to me, and I could see the fear on their face. They clutched my arms so tightly I felt their fingernails through my coveralls. What the fuck is that? This is who the Martyr's Blood Believers were waiting for, I whispered. This is the messenger of the New Age. Fuck that. I nodded in agreement. Fuck that. With the darkness abated, I looked across the clearing and saw Alpha sprawled out on their back about ten feet from where they had last been. The sonic blast must have sent them tumbling. I wasn't sure if they were still alive or not. It sickened me. Where is our creature? Omega asked. As if on cue, we heard the loudest whistle ever pierce the air. We both plugged our ears to drown out the sound, but it still got through. I could feel blood on my fingertips as they tried, but failed, to blot out the noise. We watched as the creature swung down from the treetops and landed just outside the hole. It stared at the bleeding man and let out another bone-rattling human-like scream. The bleeding man bellowed back, sending a booming echo around the mountain range. The creature charged the bleeding man and leapt at him with its razor arms poised to strike. The bleeding man ducked, but they were too late. The creature tumbled over his shoulder but stabbed an arm into the man's back, and subsequent painful yawps rattled my brain. 
That's when I noticed Alpha staggering toward the fighting monsters. My attention had been so focused on the battle that I hadn't seen Alpha walking towards them. I stood up and screamed. What the hell are you doing? But Alpha didn't stop. He was fiddling with the knob on his gear and ignored everything but the creatures. He was walking towards his own death. What's he doing? Omega yelled up at me. I don't know, I said. Then I noticed something on my gear, and a memory unlocked inside my brain. I had seen it before, but I wasn't sure what it did. The skull setting on the Pax gun. It had to be a last resort measure to close any portal the creature might have used to try and escape our dimension. But Alpha wasn't going to try to keep these things here. They were going to send them back through. Alpha was going to blow them all through the exit and close the door behind them. He's going to close the hole, I said, pointing to the pack. He's going to sacrifice himself to do it. We have to stop him. While my mind was racing, Alpha stopped just outside the edge of the opening in the ground. They fired up their pack in the shadows of the two fighting monsters. It started to glow and pulsate as it charged up. You could faintly hear his stray energy alarm bleeding over the brawl. I was sure the pack was absorbing any excess free-floating spectral energy being shed off the creatures. There was no way our packs could hold all that juice. In time, it might explode on its own, but we didn't have time. If the Bleeding Man's arrival really was a portent to the end of the world, we needed to speed up the process. We needed to trigger an explosion. Alpha glanced at me, and I knew what I had to do. I nodded back. With the last amount of energy Alpha had in their back, they ran at the hole and jumped towards the fighting monsters. As Alpha did, they held up their pack for me to target. I fired a zigzagging bolt of green from the extractor gun. The last thing I remember was the heat from the explosion racing over my body. This whole thing makes the Tunguska vent seem like a firecracker. It was my boss. He was standing over me, but his concern wasn't on my well-being. It was on the mess all around me. He was panicked and racing to conceal any evidence from the public. My eyes fluttered open. I was surrounded by teams of cleaners doing everything they could to limit the damage, but it seemed like a fool's gambit. The blast was big. How big, I didn't know. But people in the surrounding area had to have felt it. They had to have seen the fireball in the sky. As far as I could see, the forest was gone. Just erased, like it had never been there. No doubt the explosion had triggered government sensors in the area. I would be surprised if special forces weren't flying here now to survey the damage. People probably thought this was nuclear. The government would be called in to investigate. We were under a ticking clock. I thought back to the gunman telling us we had two hours to solve this problem and chuckled. GCS wouldn't even get that. The cleanup crews had to remove any evidence we had been there. The alibi department had to set up and stage a reasonable excuse as to what caused this damage. If this army of employees buzzing around the site failed to get this done, the company could be exposed. Exposure meant public hearings. Public hearings meant a lot of pissed off clients, organizations with fuck you money, and no scruples led to a lot of missing GCS leaders. I sat up, but waves of pain radiated through my body. I couldn't even specify a location for the pain. It was just everywhere. I glanced over and saw Omega hooked up to several medical machines. They were alive, but just barely. On the opposite side of me stood the gunman from before. As expected, he had an MP5 trained on us both. I don't know what he was expecting us to do other than writhe around in pain. I wasn't going to run. At that moment, I didn't even know if I was physically capable of doing so. My boss saw me sitting up and raced over. What the hell happened out there? Where's Alpha? He's gone, I said. Gone where? His gear blew up. Where's the creature? Gone. Stop being so goddamn cryptic and give me a straight answer. My boss said, his face coloring into an agitated red. He closed the hole, the portal. The bleeding man, the creature, Alpha. They were vaporized. The bleeding man. I saw it. I can explain it all later. I need to rest. The gunman put the gun in my face. 
I could smell the oil in the barrel again. This time, though, I wasn't intimidated. I stared the gunman in the eyes and pushed the gun away from my face. Shoot me when I'm feeling better, okay? I laid back down and closed my eyes. The last thing I remember hearing was my boss letting out a little laugh. I couldn't help but smile. A few seconds later, I drifted back off to sleep.